In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm here to give a message, particularly in the context of the Holy Land, which we begin on Wednesday. Yes, we are going to have the days, according to the Latin rite, 40 days. According to Oriental rite, 50 days. Lent, days of abstinence, fasting, mortification, and helping the poor, etc. What I want to share with you is this. Lent, I think, is a time we should seek the authentic Christian life. It's a time the Lord is calling you and me to examine our lives and to see whether we are following Jesus authentically. So it's a call to authentic Christian life. For a moment, my children, close your eyes. Ask the Lord to give you wisdom, knowledge and understanding and courage. Lord Jesus, I thank you and praise you for all those who are listening to this talk as we are going to enter the holy season of Lent. Open their hearts and open their mind, open their intellect. Give them wisdom, knowledge, courage to hear the word of God and to follow what they hear. Mary, Mama, Good Mother, you who stood at the foot of the cross, pray for us and be with us. Amen. When I say God is calling us to authentic Christian life, my mind goes to the reading Matthew chapter 10, where the Lord says the need to be a disciple of Christ. Matthew chapter 10, verse 37. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. We see the parallel text in Mark chapter 8, 31 onwards. Whoever wishes to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will be losing it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and that of the gospel will save it. What profit is there for one to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? What could one give in exchange for his life? Whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this faithless and sinful generation the Son of Man will be ashamed of when he comes in his Father's glory with his angels. Mark chapter 8, 34 to 38. So what do I want to say? One who really follow Christ, that means one who wants to be a disciple, should have a supreme or greatest love for Christ Jesus. That means a love that transcends the love for anyone in this world or, or anything in the world. Father or mother, brother, wife, children, daughter, land, money, above all that we must love Jesus Christ as our God. Hallelujah. So that's what I say, the first love. In the book of Revelation chapter 2, 13, the Lord says, I have an accusation against you. You lost the first love that you had. That means uh, the first love should go to God, to 
go to Jesus. That's the commandment of God. So whoever wants to follow Christ must love God first with all his soul, heart and mind. So these are times we have to ask ourselves as we are entering the land. Am I practicing this land? Maybe by fasting, abstinence or charity. Am I trying to follow Christ Jesus? Is he the center of my life? Is he the guiding star in my life? And then the Lord very clearly says we have to follow him. You know Jesus always said follow me, follow me. That means the way Jesus lived, we must live. In 1 John uh, chapter 2 verse 6 we read. 1 John chapter 2 verse 6. Whoever claims to abide in Jesus Christ should live just as he lived. Hallelujah. Difficult, no? How did Jesus live a simple life? You know, from manger to Calvary. Nowhere to lay the head. And we know a simple life, not attached to anything. So that's the life Jesus lived. And also, he took up suffering for you and for me. To what extent? To the death on the cross. Jesus said, I love you so much that I give my full life to you. In John chapter 15, verse 13, he said, A good friend lays down his life for the one whom he loves. Yes, Jesus is our friend. He's our Lord and Master, laying down his life for us. So our love for God, love for Jesus, should be to the extent of giving ourselves, giving our life for him. And when we say for him, we should know a life for others. Love has two sides. Like a coin has two sides. Loving God means loving the neighbor. So that's what Jesus did. He loved God the Father, his Papa. And with that love, he loved you and me. So this is the way to follow Christ Jesus. And for that, we need to Deny our self. It's very hard, no? Uh, self means our ego. I am what I am because of my ego. And the Lord is telling, deny it. This is what he did. He was equal with God the Father. He was God, we know. Second person of the Trinity. So he was equal to God the Father. Equal to the Holy Spirit. But he emptied that ego and then became a man not only really simply a man a slave for us a servant for us we read in Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 one verse although he was equal with God he did not mind it he did not care it he emptied himself that word is something great emptied himself of his godliness Became a man like you and me. Except for sin, he was like you and me, my dear friends, my dear brothers and sisters. We must meditate that. And this is what we must do to love God and to show that love of God in our neighbor. For example, relationship between a husband and wife. Uh, both should empty their ego so that they can be one. Why there are so many problems in the married life today? Even to the extent of divorce, the husband or wife not ready to lay down his or her life for the other person. Not willing to break the ego. I can tell you very honestly, my children, that's why I call you. To love someone, we have to empty ourselves. Then only authentically we can love others. Why we love others? Because in others we see Jesus our God. That's the reason we love others. That's the reason we lay down our life for others. Uh, if you 
Sometimes I meditate myself, my ego. I'm a man, I'm a Christian, I'm educated, and naturally speaking, I should have got married and have children and a family and have money in the bank or in the land. I must have wealth. That's a life meant for me. But I, by the call of Christ to preach to, emptied all those ambitions, all desires, all natural way of my life. And then I wanted to serve others, give my life to others as a priest. You know, I'm a vagabond now, going around preaching, doing good for others. And that means I have my own ambitions, my own desires. I have to, I had to empty them. Uh, or I had to kill that ego. So it's not I, but Christ lives in me to help me. So also, not only with regard to a priest or a nun, with regard to every Christian, it should be the norm. It should be the way of life. The denying of self. When there is self-love, we are unable to love others as we should. That's why we have to break ourselves in order to uh, love others wholeheartedly. And then Jesus said, taking up the cross. Love without suffering is no love at all, I would say. If Jesus had not suffered, even to the extent of dying on the cross, when he said, I love you, I call you friends, it was a lie. He wanted to prove himself, but he said was not lie. We know in Jesus we see, he lived the life what he taught. Not like the Pharisees, not like the scribes or the leaders of his time. We know today we see many are living for themselves, not for others. And Jesus is telling us, give your life or live your life. For God, that means seeing God in others. For that we have to suffer. If Jesus had not suffered, you and I would not have been redeemed. If you are telling one word, you are redeemed, there was no love. That is why he suffered. That's always he was telling, no, I must go to Jerusalem. I should suffer and I should be put to death. Third day, I should rise again. He was reminding himself of his responsibility to break himself, deny himself, and take up the cross. Yes, we have to ask ourselves as we are going to begin this Lent, as we are going to meditate in the Gospels and relatives during the Holy Mass during these 50 or 40 days, about the passion of Christ, about the sufferings of Christ. How I something to say that I love Jesus, love others. Do I am, I am ready to suffer with him. I'm not saying about unnecessary suffering, no. Taking up the cross, there are two kinds of suffering. One, natural suffering that comes. Sometimes because of our foolishness, because we are not managing well, for us we may end up in bankruptcy as suffering. Or for us a sickness may fall. And we fall sick. And then we are suffering. Now, these are not what I say. Purposely taking up the cross. Taking up the suffering for another person. If we look at ourselves, perhaps only very few times we suffer for others. But that is the authentic life. For example, I take the example always of the husband and wife. Because our relationship with God is like that of a husband and wife. So, uh, a wife, if she's not ready to suffer for her husband and vice versa, if a husband is not ready to suffer for the wife, there cannot be real love. If I keep myself, my ego, and not ready to break my ego and saying, I want to be what I am. This is the world today. This is the reason many young people don't want to get married. Yes, they lost the meaning of the cross. Yes, Jesus suffered the cross for us because he loves us. 
and in order that the husband and wife like love each other or oh, parents and children love there should be the sacrifice this meaning of the cross in their life today if you look around the world we can see there are many boys and girls not getting married and many are not willing to go to become priest or a nun the reason they don't want to deny themselves and they don't want to follow the life of christ this is missing if we look at jesus what comes prominent in our heart is his suffering on the cross we know so my dear friends my children i encourage you to follow jesus in his self denial and taking up the cross and following and you should know us we heard just now from mark chapter 8 our soul is unique nothing or no one can substitute our soul as i say no one was created like me james till this moment my god god will not create anyone like me i am what i am i that i am unique for god and if i am unique i should know that i should live for god nobody can substitute me my father mother wife children nobody can i am i am i that is, again i come back to that point i am ego my ego myself should go to god god created for that so unique that's why the lord said even if you gain the whole world what does it profit if you lose your soul many times i told this we you know this one sentence have given conversion to many like saint augustine we know when he heard that word first he repented of his sin he put his hands on the chest started crying i am unique before god nobody can substitute me and if i lose my soul that made him repent of his sins and the past sinful life and to become a saint from that moment yes we as we enter land put your hands on the chest as a conscience ask ourselves we are seeking after worldly uh, encouragement worldly love or worldly uh, or what called positions and uh, we should know what is it for it when i die i to go with my soul before the lord all what i have gained in position so money wise everything will be lost so once in a while it is good to think of that you know when i meditate this word what does it profit me uh, if you lose your soul and gain the whole world i think of myself i go around the world had preach uh, the word of god gospel in more than 104 countries and thousands even millions of people have heard my talks god conversion become new creatures new people yeah i'm trying to conquer the whole world yes every priest is sent to preach the word of god the gospel and to conquer the world but what does it profit if if i do not save my own life that's why uh, we can see uh, paul the apostle in philippians uh, chapter to what chapter 2 was told says with the fear and trembling work for your own salvation hallelujah hallelujah the fear and trembling work for your own salvation sometimes we preached or oh, nuns bishops were engaged for the salvation of souls that means working for evangelization may not sometimes find time to pray may not find time to be with the god with jesus in the holy eucharist personal prayer etc or some kind of mortification or doing some kind of penance maybe we are telling others to do that and we forget about our own salvation that's why everyone 
the priest or nun or lay people should know that what is more important is to save your own life. To save your own life. Here, when we are trying to save our own life, we should know through that we are saving many others. If only we are saved through us, many others can be saved. So, let us think about what you call an authentic Christian life uh, and authentic way of following Christ during this Lent. May this Lent be a time to think about all this and come to Christ. And we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, chapter 9, verse 19 onwards. To those who under the law, I became like one under the law. Though I myself am not under the law, to win over those under the law. To those outside the law, I became like one outside the law. Though I am not outside God's law, but within the law of Christ. To win over those outside the law. And verse 22, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 22. To the weak I became weak, to win over the weak. Have become all things to all, to save at least some. All this I do for the sake of the gospel, so that I too may have a share in it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, we have to save others by saving ourselves. And that's what very clearly Paul says. I became all things to all save in order to save at least some. And here, uh, of course, we must know that during this time of Lent, often we look at the crucifixion and we think of the, what we call, crucifixion of Christ. And there, of course, we must spend more time meditating on what happened on the cross. How he became sin for others. We read in 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, verse 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 21. Jesus who did not know sin. That means who did not commit sin. Uh, of course, he was God. He could do nothing with the sin. Became sin for us so that we may gain righteousness. We may gain holiness of blood. Yes. That means he carried our sins and became sin. In the eyes of all, Jesus was a criminal, although he never committed crime. We know he was never a criminal. Here we see how he emptied himself. He who was healthy became a man of suffering. And man with more than 5,000 wounds on his body by which we are being saved. And we can see a man who was wealthy. That means God the creator. The whole wealth of the universe is in the hand of God. He emptied himself in order to make us rich. He became poor in order to make us rich. And so we see, although he was never committed a crime, he became a criminal for us. He had, he had no curses because he had no ancestors uh, to have curses from the sins of the ancestors. He himself never did a sin. So no consequence of sin, no curse. But he became curse for us. As we read uh, in Galatians chapter 3, uh, verse 16. He became cursed for us. And thus he became all things to all. That means we see around us maybe sinners. We should take their sin as God's pardon. This is what Jesus did, no? He never sinned, but as a sinner on the cross, he pleaded for God's mercy for the sins of us all. So we should have that sympathy when we see sinners around us. Also people who are poor. Not only materially poor. 
but spiritually poor. As uh, Saint Benedict used to say, there are two kinds of poverty. One is material poverty, other one is spiritual poverty. That means people without having the living blood from heaven, without having the living water, the Holy Spirit from heaven. Many, even among Christians and Catholics, not knowing the blood from heaven, that is the living Jesus, and the living water, the Holy Spirit, dying in sin and losing their souls. We should feel love for them. And we should uh, take their poverty and thirst on their behalf. Yes, uh, we ourselves may be filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with the body of Christ, the living blood from heaven. But we should know our neighbors are hungry and they are thirsty. Take that thirst, take that hunger and pray for them and do whatever we can. Then we can see change happening. So I, if I go on telling as Jesus crucified himself for our sake, we should be able to crucify ourselves for others. It's very hard, surely. Crucifixion is painful and nobody likes to be crucified. But the Lord wants us to be so. So that we can be like him. This is our vocation. We read in Romans chapter 8 verse 29. Romans verse chapter 8, 29. From all eternity you are called to be unto the image of his son Jesus. So we have to conform ourselves to the image of Christ. In English, to be like Christ. That is our occasion. Every Christian, every baptized person should be like Christ. That's why in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, we read, Don't conform yourself to this world, but transform yourself to be like Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is the work of the Holy Spirit, surely. If only we open our heart to the Holy Spirit, He can enter into our heart and give this transformation so that we may be like Jesus. That means having the character of Jesus and putting on the style of Jesus' life and others should be able to see Jesus in you and in me. That is the success of Christian life. Today, if we look at the world, people fail to see that. And we see Christians almost uh, persecuted. And today, uh, they are trying to wipe out Christianity from the world. But as I may speak about it in another video. Everywhere, people are trying. We heard in Turkey, they destroyed a, ch a church and made mosques. In India, you hear. The churches are destroyed or most territory and temples are being built like that, trying to get away with the Christianity and killing the pastors or killing the priests or uh, faithful people who are following Christ. A big persecution is at hand. Perhaps Christians may remain as a ransom, uh, uh, sorry, uh, a small group of people, a small group of people. Uh, Maybe we will be like the refugees now during the war going around the world. We may be vagabonds. We may be only few. I say, let us prepare ourselves to stand any persecution, any suffering, so that even if the world tries to get rid of us, we will not because we belong to a church which is founded on Christ. And we know the gates of in other words, the gates of hell will not overcome, will not defeat the church. So we should have that faith. And that last word we heard from Mark. Uh, if you are ashamed of me and my words, my heavenly father will be ashamed of you. We know Matthew chapter 10, 32 and 33. Everyone who acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before God the Father. 
If anyone denies me before others, I will deny before God my Father. Matthew chapter 10, 32 and 33. So, whatever persecution, whatever might happen, we must be sure that we belong to Christ, we love Christ, we follow the values taught by the Bible and Christ, and go ahead, standing firm on the foundation of Jesus and his word. I'm sure, as I see in my prayer, Christianity will be a diaspora. Will be scattered all over. In India, or in Africa, or any European countries, uh, we will see uh, diaspora means a remnant, uh, a few people. But I am asking you to be one among that few. Hallelujah. Yes, these days when I come to Europe to preach, or when I preach in India or elsewhere, in my mind, I'm trying to form, train uh, a few people to be authentic Catholic Christians so that in future, the Lord may be able to build on that remnant. I will be able to build on that diaspora. Let this learn be a time you make a decision, my children. Yes, time is short. I am not saying about my talk. Our lifespan is short. We don't know when we have to reach eternity. Maybe this year or next year or within a few years or a few months. And we don't have a, what you call tomorrow. Yesterday is gone. All what we have is today. So make a decision today, my children, to live an authentic Christian life according to God's word, values, norms, and the ways given to us by Christ through the word of God and the preaching of the church so that we may celebrate this land meaningfully with the more prayer with more commitment to God's love, commitment to the love of neighbor, helping others, etc. You know, when I see the non-Christians, the Hindus, or even Muslims, how they spend the time of fasting. All religions have time set apart for fasting. For example, I've seen Muslims. During the whole day, they don't eat anything. Night, they have a sumptuous meal. But they invite the poor around and eat with them. And the gain, the money they gain by the day's fasting, they collect and give to the poor. In Arabic, they call it zakat. Zakat is for the poor. Some accuse that that money goes for terrorism. Maybe true. Terrorism means they want to conquer the whole world. Islam wants to conquer the whole world. This is what Jesus told you and me. Go and Preach the gospel and save all. Bring everyone under the reign of God, reign of Jesus Christ. For that you have to spend our money. Yes, nothing wrong in spending money uh, for the propagation of faith. So, this is what I see among Islam. Hindus, especially I was, uh, I'm in India now. It's a season they go for pilgrimage. 41 days they fast. You know, I heard from them. Uh, they eat only half of the meal they used to eat every day. And no fish, no egg, and no meat, and no banquets, no eating of the old food that is left out. And even husband and wife refrain from sexual relationship as a parents, 41 days. And, and then they walk up to the uh, place of that pilgrimage. Many kilometers, I can say 150, even 200 kilometers with a bag on the head, which they surrender to their God, and a small handbag behind. That means what is necessary to eat or to dress, etc. Sometimes they don't have even a shower, smelling. Yes, they suffer that. And very hot in India, you know, now it is 40 degrees. Walking in the sun, do penance. Yes. When I look at Christians, we are lost that spirit of suffering, spirit of penance. You know, in olden times, every Friday, Christians used to fast. 
slowly it was a uh, program in the land every friday fasting now only two days ash wednesday and good friday and how many do really fast don't do stay two days we have to ask ourselves yes we have to follow jesus in the way he walked from manger to calvary somehow other we have to share his life and be in union with him that is christian life it is only when we are united with him life of christ should be manifested in our lives so i conclude i think i took long a time i want to give a short message uh, close your eyes close your eyes put your hand on the chest and reflect how i am going to do this land When the Lord looks from heaven upon the world, will He count me with a few, with the diaspora, with the remnant that is really fiery with the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit, with enthusiasm, great earnestness to follow Jesus? In one word, having a passionate love for Jesus, and that love for Jesus. expressed by loving others lord jesus help these my listeners to ponder over to reflect on what they heard and be prepared to live as an authentic christian catholic so that when he looks at these who are making that decision may be gathered together and surrender them to god the father Yes, help them, Lord. They have their difficulties and problems, frailties and weaknesses. Enable them to find strength, grace in those weaknesses. As St. Paul said, when I am weak, I am strong. Enable them to find the power of the Holy Spirit in them, in all their weaknesses. And thus to overcome the weaknesses and be strong and powerful Christians on this earth. and to them the whole world may be redeemed and a new world may be born mary mama good mother i take all these people who listen to me to the heart of your son and pray i bless all of you keeping you all in the heart of jesus to the heart taking all your problems and pains and difficulties sicknesses into the wounds of Christ and bless you in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen praise the lord hallelujah have a grace filled spirit filled land that the land of this year be something unique something special to follow Jesus Christ the Lord amen hallelujah